Hello everybody. You are watching a video that was made by me, an airline pilot, which means that you are into aviation. But how into aviation do you think you are? Today I brought six questions again, but this time it's a bit harder to answer than the first video. By answering today's questions, you will be able to judge the level of your enthusiasm into aviation. Let's dive right in. To answer this question, I guess I have to tell you the concept of the aircraft speeds. Speed in cars measured by how many revolutions are made in certain time, but airplanes fly. This is why the airplanes ended up having several kinds of speeds. Indicated airspeed, true airspeed, ground speed, Mach number, and so on. Among these speeds, Ground speed is the closest concept as the speed in cars. It varies a lot with the winds though. Sometimes wind could be blowing as fast as 350 km per hour, which is 230 miles an hour. Max speed for Boeing 787 itself is roughly 920 km per hour, or 570 miles an hour. This is just a ballpark figure because it varies with the altitudes. Nothing is simple in the airplane, isn't it? Okay, if we cruise with the tailwind like that, max speed of the aircraft can go up to like 1,300 kilometers per hour or 800 miles per hour. On the other hand, when they cruise with the headwinds, the speed can be as low as 550 kilometers per hour or 340 miles an hour. Boeing 737 is widely used narrow-body aircraft. It weighs up to around 80 tons or 180,000 pounds. The largest airliner is Airbus A380, the ugly double-deck monster. This guy is certified to carry up to 850 passengers. It's insane. And to top of its fuel tanks, 323,000 liters or 85,000 US gallons of jet fuel is needed. For maximum certified takeoff weight for Airbus A380 is 575 tons or 1,267,000 pounds. Even if you are not interested in aviation, you might have seen this in some movies. V1. V1. When something goes wrong during takeoff roll, Pilots sometimes have to give up taking off. Reject. Speed brakes up. And stop the airplane on the runway. On the runway, not on the grass. In order to do so, pilots have to continue to take off even with a failure when they think it's too late to stop. This is why V1 is called a takeoff decision speed. Once beyond this speed, Pilots are not to stop the airplane, even one engine is failed. B1. Rotate, engine failure. V1 is precisely calculated for every takeoff not to overrun the runway in case of rejected takeoff. For ordinary passengers, even if you are frequent flyers, most of you may not know what these things are, but if you think you're an aviation enthusiast, you must have seen these protruding things once or twice. And you might be aware these are the sensors. Do you also know what exactly they do? This is a speed sensor called pitot tube. This guy senses how much air is coming from the front, and it sends the data to flight computers Finally, the computers give the speed information to pilots. This speed is called indicated airspeed. This one is called a TAT probe, some kind of thermometer. TAT stands for total air temperature, which is different from normal temperature. More specifically, some kind of compensation is taken into account. As the plane increases its speed, the temperature on the surface of the aircraft rises a bit due to the heat of friction. This TAT has a lot to do with the aircraft systems. 
This weird looking thing is an angle measuring device. Angle? What angle? We call it AOA vein, angle of attack vein. For the airplane flying, there's always some angle between the direction of the flying aircraft and the relative wind. As this angle gets larger, the aircraft gets more lift. But when it goes over a certain limit, the airplane will start to stall. As you can see here, these sensors are installed on both sides of the airplane. Redundancy. There's almost nothing as a single device in the airplane. As you know that the airliners have to carry a huge amount of fuel. Most of the fuel is normally loaded in the wing tank. Some of the long-haul airplanes also have a tank in their belly. And Airbus planes like A330 or A350 have very special fuel tanks that Boeing planes don't. They can contain some amount of fuel in the back, I mean in the elevators. They're called trim tanks. The main purpose of this is to send certain amount of fuel from trim tanks to the wing tanks or vice versa. Why do you think they do that? This is all about fuel efficiency. By moving certain amount of fuel backward or forward, the center of gravity of the aircraft can be shifted. And they are capable of maintaining optimal CG condition throughout the flight. This helps quite a lot to save fuel for long range of flights. I believe that you have had this kind of complaint once or twice. For what do pilots leave the seatbelt sign on, even when the ride became smooth? Pilots are very sensitive to turning on or off the seatbelt sign. It's all about flight safety, of course. Even to pilots, it's quite hard to know when it's going to be bumpy during the flight. They study en route weather forecast during the flight briefing in order to figure out how the ride for the day is going to be. With that being said, Turbulence frequently comes out of nowhere, out of the blue. Pilots try to come up with an idea by analyzing several things before they turn it off or on. They're like wind speed or direction changes, or cloud patterns and all that. Lots of pilots are very conservative, since they're in charge of the safety of the passengers, and so is company policy. The more conservative a pilot is, the longer time the seatbelt sign might be on for. But the truth is, seatbelt sign should always be respected for your safety. Okay, today we've gone through sort of aviation enthusiast thing part two. So, how many questions did you hit the answer? I hope you just enjoy the video for fun, but I'll come back sometime later with some pilot level questions, if you guys want. Thank you very much for watching today. I'll see you in my next video. I'm Captain JK. Have a great day.